Welcome, welcome to the introduction to the F Sharp case study. Sitting next to me is a man who needs no introduction, although I'll introduce him anyway. His name is Daniel B. Markham, a man who trains agile teams around the country and also is something of an F Sharp aficionado. Did I represent that correctly? So far, so good. Bob. So far, so good. So, Daniel. Uh, when did you start this F Sharp adventure of yours? Oh wow! I started F Sharp when it first came out. I was really enthusiastic about trying some new programming languages. Um, F Sharp was a functional language. I'd never done functional programming before, and I said, "Got to learn me some new stuff." Okay. All right. And this was a long time ago then, right? When F Sharp first came out, the, the dinosaurs ruled the Earth. Um, then the, uh, the the Earth cooled after that, and then okay. F Sharp came later. Okay, yeah, all right, so, um, um, and why do you like this language? I mean, you've been doing it for a while now, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I tell you, um, I'm really enthusiastic about F-sharp. It really, wow, it does so much. I, I got into Lean Startup, I guess, three or four years ago. Lean Startup. Yeah, big fan of startups. I, uh, I like making stuff people want. Uh, I think so many times as programmers, we get absorbed in the technology itself, instead of actually fulfilling a need for folks. And this has something to do with F-sharp. And this has something to do with F-sharp. It does. <laughs> um, and what Lean Startup showed me was that it was very important to deliver something immediately to somebody to review and get tighten up that value feedback loop. Now, so this is an agile value, right? We want, to, we want to go around the loop fast and deliver value quickly. Well, even more so with Lean Startup, there's a, a minimal viable product concept okay, okay. that says you actually build something to determine if there is a value or not. Okay, right. Um, and so what F Sharp taught me was that in functional programming, you're always looking for return value. And just like Lean Startup, well, it, that's because we're dealing with functions and functions have return value. It's a crazy, Good, okay. it's yeah, a crazy world we live in, Bob. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So, uh, so Lean Startup tells me that I need to show something to somebody to see if there's a value there. Okay. F Sharp tells me that I always need to be thinking about what's coming back from this function. And it sounds like it's trivial. Uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of this is going to sound trivial on the surface, but it's a different way of thinking about programming. For instance, let me give you an example. Okay. Right. If I'm writing an application to, I don't know, sort numbers or balance somebody's checkbook, one of my favorite examples. Uh, in an OO world, I might initially write a test, of course, and then I start writing some code to actually make that test run, and that code would go in a class somewhere. Uh, and I would okay, probably name sure. it after some object sure. or whatever. But in OO, I'm always wondering about where things go. Uh, if things go in the wrong spot, I move them. Okay. If I have too much right. stuff in one spot, I split it up. Okay. I'm constantly concerned about things being in the correct spot. Okay. And a good OO program has a bunch of kind of, I don't want to say sparse classes, but it has a lot of sort of wiring and stuff hanging together with just little bits of functionality here and there. Okay, yes, right? I understand what you're saying. Because you don't want your methods to be, you know, mm -hmm. you don't want the king class thing, you don't want the uh, 10 or 20 line methods. Whereas in, fu in the functional world, I'm always interested in what does this thing do as opposed to where things go. Okay. And so when I were, if I was writing that application in an MVP format, I would write a function that would just return back a dummy value. Because I want to go to the user of that dummy value and say, is this valuable to you? And so in two lines of code, I've actually created a feedback loop, whereas in OO, I may have maybe 10 lines of code or 40 or whatever. Okay. Like I said, it sounds trivial. Yeah. Over time, it tends to stack up quite a bit. I'm going to... I'm gonna. No, not yet. I'll just accept what you've said there, and you right. and I can debate this later. Um, but let me ask a different question. Sure. Now, I, I've been doing functional programming for some time, although the, the functional programming I've been doing is in Clojure, which is... A, a dynamically typed functional mm -hmm. language. F sharp is a statically typed functional yes. language based on OCaml, right? Or right. ML or OCaml. Well, OCaml is based on ML. Correct. Okay, all right. Yes. All right. So 
Why is the type system so important? There are many functional programmers who get religious about this. Are you religious about this? Not about type system. I'm religious about a few things. Uh, spaces versus tabs. Oh, yeah. I don't, well, I don't, okay, but that's a I don't hang out with tabs, folks. Okay, okay, I'm right, sorry, yeah. Right. Uh, but, uh, yeah, OCaml is actually not a programming language. It was invented to, to prove theorems, computational pr theorems, or ML at least. And then OCaml was a growth off of, of ML. And so the object version. The object of version, right? Okay. So this was never really put together to be a, a sort of language to solve problems for folks. And so here we are. And so here we are solving problems for folks, of course. Okay. Uh, right. It was a good beta, so we, we, we're, we're going to scale it out. Um, but the thing is with, uh, with OCaml is that with a strong type system and what they call type inference, uh, the system itself can figure out what types it needs. So what, what I actually find with my coding is that I will start, start with a really strongly typed function. Mm -hmm. And then as I work through the function and as I manipulate it and refactor it, it actually becomes a generic function. And then I can put it in a toolbox and use it later on. So I'm actually creating reasonable code as I go along, as opposed to some other paradigms. I'm not going to say, oh, oh but I, you know, some other paradigms who say you produce reasonable code, but actually never do. I, I create reasonable code all the time. Uh, so yeah, and I'm not... The word reusability has been an evil word in the objectorial um, <laughs> pantheon for quite some time because promises were made that were not kept. Yes. Uh, and what we really understand is that code is reused out of functional libraries much more than it is used out of big class libraries. However, having said that, I want, I want to get back to the, the typing issue because what you just told me was that F sharp infers types well enough to be more like a dynamically typed language. It, right? it doesn't impose to. the rigidity upon you that a statically typed language often does. Correct. So you feel I've got the best the freedom of words. that I feel in closure. No, like I can pass a string into a function that wants yeah. an integer. <laughs> yeah. Biocodius, my friend. Yeah, well. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, in JavaScript, I can pass a bullet and needs a yeah. string. Yeah. But no, the thing is, is that I start with usually tightly typed functions because I know I want to do this particular thing very well. And as I start looking at it, I'm like, no, wait a minute, this, be, this is a generic function and I don't care about the types. Whereas in a sort of a dynamic language, I wouldn't care to begin with. And then I may end up in a situation where I have a bool and I think I wanted a string. I, I never run into that with F-sharp at all. Okay. All right. So... So I think I understand, and I'm, I'm looking forward to our exploration together into this interesting language, which I am not an expert in, by the way, but, well, I, I did take the, uh, the one-day course. So, Ooh. having said that, let us begin. Okay, cool beans.